was Kathleen Hanna of the rock band Bikini Kill performing back in 1994. The rebel girl herself, Kathleen, was part of the riot girl movement that blasted open the boys-only gates of the punk rock world and brought feminism out of the university and into the mosh pit and basement concert hall. Formerly with Bikini Kill, Kathleen went on to make feminist dance music with Le Tigre, and she became a role model for the so-called third wave. Recently, she donated her zine collection to New York University for its brand new Riot Girl collection. In her honor, we have renamed the show today Gore TV. <laughs> We're really glad to have you, Kathleen. Would you ever have thought you would have gone into being described as a role model. You're supposed to be a riot instigator. Um, no. <laughs> I definitely, my whole joke was like, I'd rather be a rollerblade model. But um, no, I never really thought of it. And I was like, when people, people ask me about that a lot, they're like, how does it feel to be an icon or a role model? I mean, not like all the time, but occasionally. And um, I always just say I want to be, if I am a role model, I want to be a really three-dimensional role model who like makes mistakes and learns from them and not try to be, um, do everything right all the time. All right, mistake number one. What's the biggest mistake you've learned from? <laughs> oh I could give you a long list of no, mine, I could give so don't let me so, put you on the spot here. So many. I think when I was in my 20s, I got really caught up in kind of like some horizontal oppression stuff and like petty intrigues at the expense of like real productive dialogue. And oh, wait, now when you say horizontal oppression stuff, what do you mean? I mean like, you know, a lot of arguments that were based in semantics more than action. Mm -hmm. And I mean, um, people's insecurities being played off as if they were political dialogues when really they were just personal things that were recast in a political light as a way for people to gain power for themselves, like individual power. And I would get really upset and offended and like try to argue and sometimes when people are on a certain kind of tangent, you really can't argue and you need to remove yourself from the discussion. And as a grown up, I've gotten a lot better at removing myself <laughs> from the discussion. Your um, biography though, you have to deal a lot. I think all of us have to deal a lot as women, let alone feminist women, let alone women for whom there is a reputation that precedes you before you get there, with how do you be yourself and break the boundaries that you want to break? Um, and not alienate too many people along the way. You talked a lot about really ha moving into a very macho scene as an early music maker. Yeah, it was, it was pretty crazy back then. And it's, it's interesting when I meet um, women in their 20s now who are like, you know, ask me about the band or like what shows were like because they weren't there. And I say, oh, well, there's a lot of violence. And, you know, it was this thing of like constantly being told to, you know, take off our tops and, you know, that kind of thing, like yelling from the audience and things like that still happen, I think, um, especially maybe in the underground punk scene more than in the dance scene, which I've kind of moved more into. But um, it's a lot better now. And there's a lot more women at shows and just a lot more diversity at um, shows in general. And for that, I'm just totally thankful. And I feel really glad that I was a teeny tiny weeny weeny part of it. But I, I'm really amazed that, that um, some people don't even know that in the 90s it was as bad as it was. And I personally was shocked that it was as bad as it was. I mean, we're not talking the 60s, we're talking the 90s, yeah. and you were having people throw things at you. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had like chains thrown at our heads. I got pulled off the stage by my ankles once. Um, we had our roadie was assaulted while we were playing. She, was, she got in the way to defend me. A guy was trying to grab me, and she was knocked out. Um, all kinds of things, like really um, riots at shows. Who were your supporters at that time? Because it wasn't like the 70s. There wasn't like a whole movement that at least was visible on the national scene. What was the context that enabled you to keep going? Um, well, I mean, we were really lucky because the Homocore scene had kind of started, which was like a loosely affiliated network of people who are writing these like queer zines. Like people now call it the queer zine explosion or there's a lot of different names for it. And, so like people like G.B. Jones, um, her band Fifth Column, and a lot of the movies that she made, uh, The Troublemakers, and The Yo-Yo Gang, and like our friend Donna Drush, who was in um, a bunch of different bands. Like there were a lot of women, Lori Tversky, who wrote Bitch Magazine. There's a bitch now, but there was a bitch back then um, from California that was this amazing newsprint zine that was all women in music. And it had a definite political edge, but it was like, really infused with the writing and it was great writing like more like an Ellis, Ellen Willis typewriter. Um, I don't know, there were a lot of really great people that inspired us and I think anytime 
when we were, um, you know, being kind of overly criticized and people were throwing stuff at us and it was really frustrating, we would go back to the van and read their zines <laughs> or, you know what I mean, read the feminist theory we were reading. And I think we always told each other, you know, the more people are pissed off, the more we know we're doing a good job. And To give people a glimpse of what went, what went after Bikini Kill, here's a clip of La Tigre in performance. And then in case you think I'm kidding about the role model part, I'll show you I'm not. to that, to NBC, not bad. <laughs> you, you watched that and you went, ah, oh, that's so great. I was really psyched because um, we actually didn't know that all of these friends had shown up. Like we sent out an email and um, then we got out on stage and we saw them and it wasn't just friends, it was actually there was a woman there who was at one of the first Riot Girl meetings in like 92 who I hadn't seen since that time and she came. Oh, and I, I was just like, it just felt like, you know, Speaking of support, like there always has been people who have totally supported us vehemently and, and been there for us. And, and you have clearly been there for a lot of people. And just to get back to that point of ro that role modeling, take a look. This is just one of a gazillion videos you can find on YouTube. Uh, Bikini Kill was one of my favorite bands in high school. And this is our tribute to them. So. We're all Raw Replica and we want revolution! Girls, stop! literally a zillion to choose from like that. Are you hopeful about where that revolution, where that riot is today? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of great things happening. There's a lot of great um, women in bands, like trans activism has come a huge long way from when we first started, like not just for women, but for like, well, for all different kinds of women, but also for, you know, gay and lesbian kids, you know, when we tour around the country, we see all these like GBLT groups that are forming in high schools. And that was just unheard of when I was a kid. So I think things are really hopeful. And then in the music scene. But at the same time, you have Jay Mayer, uh, John Mayer saying the kind of crazy stuff he says about his <laughs> David Duke accoutrement. You have, you know, the uh, Miley Cyrus pole dancing on the yeah. ice cream truck. How do you make sense of it? I don't. I mean, I just think that that stuff's crap and like I just don't <laughs> care about it. You know what I mean? Like there's so much good art and literature and music to choose from that it's like great if that stuff isn't completely been invaded by creepy people and ruined. You know, I just I want to, you know, read great books and go to great shows. And All right. So who are you art. listening to right now? I actually have not been listening to that much music because I've been on a break and um, I've really liked it. I mean, I listen to like older music. Um, a lot of like instrumental stuff, uh, a lot of French stuff lately. But I've been listening to the bands from Willie May Rock Camp, actually. Um, this band called Awkward Turtles, which I really like. They're like, I think they're like in the eighth grade or the ninth grade. I was gonna say, Willie May Rock Camp for girls is for really for girls. For it's for 11 to 17 year olds. And it's a, a rock camp where they go for one or two weeks. And it's like on the first day, they fill out a questionnaire of what they wanna do. And then they get put in a band. And then on the Saturday, at the end of that week, they write a song. And some of the bands, I mean, they perform a song like at a showcase. It's amazing. It's totally amazing. We've got a clip of it. Take a quick look. We yes. sent a reporter to take a look and came up with this last week, last year. Take a look. Willie Mae Rock Camp for Girls started five years ago in New York. And it was based on the Portland, Oregon Rock and Roll Camp for Girls. They started it, they created the idea, and a bunch of us who are musicians here in New York ended up volunteering out there. And I went out there and taught bass, and the experience just changed my life. When I came back to New York, uh, I thought it would be really great if we had a rock camp here. So I worked with a group of other women, and we started uh, the New York Rock Camp. 
I never played an instrument in my life. So it was a new experience, but it was great because I always wanted to learn. I was always told I should play the piano. Keyboard was closest thing to it, and I like the synths, so it's cool. Oh. Yeah, it's really fun. It is definitely a lot of the cool, girls thanks to Susie here. Salami for that <laughs> report. Um, Rock Camp for Girls, you're an advisor there. Uh, you said you were taking a little respite from listening to music. What do you think is next for Kathleen Hanna? Well, um, we just started a Bikini Kill archive blog so that um, all of our fans and people who saw us play could actually write into us about their experiences seeing us because we want to make sure that that stuff is kind of archived. And I'm really obsessed with the idea of archives right now because I just donated my papers um, to NYU. I'm actually giving them my filing cabinet tomorrow, <laughs> which I'm very excited but kind of tearful of seeing that. Thing go. Now, some people were commenting on that um, giving of your papers to NYU said, what? Zines? What? Why do we need zines at one of our premier universities? Well, it's not just zines. It's actually, it's going to be correspondence and also um, the flat copies of our zines, which I think are really important because it shows, it's going to show people in the future, like, you know, we, everything was not made on the yeah. internet, like how we actually cut and pasted stuff. Um, and there's other items in there that are just like, stuff before we had the first Riot Girl meeting, which was this group that started in DC that I was a part of forming. And I found like weird notebooks that were like, I want Riot Girl to be like this. And like all my ideas before it even happened. And a lot of them didn't come true. And a lot, some of them did, and some of them fell by the wayside. And do you I think, think it's interesting. Do you think Riot Girl, Girl and, the, and the zine movement kind of um, anticipated what blogs would be in the end? What was it? Uh, what was your mission with Riot Girl magazine? Well, with the zines, it was like really kind of ephemeral and like just of the moment, which I really loved because you could write something really immediate. It wasn't like a magazine that you have to do something three months in advance. It was like you had an idea, you wrote it down, you did it that night. So in a way, it's really similar to yeah. blogging. And it was also about like um, getting over your insecurities and not having to be professional and like, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's totally perfectly. It was like, I'm just going to write whatever. You know, it was very frantic and very much kind of in keeping with like the punk rock sensibility and in a way the arrogance <laughs> of youth. But um, I think the thing that's different between blogging and between and the, and the zines is that in a way, the zines were supposed to be historical and for this, not historical as in like put in the archive right. and it wasn't planned to have that happen, but that they existed in this one specific time period. And the thing that I sometimes don't like about blogs or that doesn't suit me for that kind of work is that it um, it can seem really ahistorical. Yeah, yeah. Like it, somebody can just take a page of your zine, put it on there, not date it, and it seems like something you wrote when you were 22, you wrote yesterday. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I like, I like the objectness. Any thoughts on Hillary Clinton, Sarah Palin, <sighs> all the talk about post-feminism? <sighs> I'm so sick of the post-feminism thing. It's so ridiculous. I, I want more. I want more interesting leaders. I think the thing that really um, is hard for feminist women who are also interested in challenging like all kinds of oppression is that we're freaked out about leadership, and so there's not more interesting leaders. And a lot of times we kill off our own leaders. I mean, not just I think because we're women, but because we're in a culture that you know we create products and then we destroy those products the same way that we lift people up and it's like the kill your idol syndrome and then we're like they're not good enough this is wrong and we get all picky about everything and i just i don't know i just i wish there was more feminist leaders to choose from a more a larger variety so we'll talk about that just for a moment because a lot of people put a lot of hopes and dreams into a leader recently barack obama the new president the first african-american president etc yeah. etc and a lot of people are feeling disappointed that's kind of inevitable with leaders yeah, exactly. um what do you think is an alternative model as you just said is it lots of leaders is it what I definitely think lots of leaders <laughs> is good, but I, I feel like instead of having this put all eggs in one basket of like one leader and then everybody else is like totally freaked out about stepping to the plate, I, I feel like we need to support and honor the fact that some people are really good at stepping yeah. up and some people are really good at being a spokesperson or dealing with the media or being uh, in a leadership role. And I just feel like in a lot of um, kind of community activist stuff, that can be really seen as threatening and reproducing negative hierarchies okay. of all kinds. And then that person isn't applauded or like, you know, some people are good at being a writer. Some people are good at, you know, whatever they're good at. And why shouldn't we also say with our feminist leaders, like, congratulations, you're great at this. Yes. 
We don't all have to agree all the time. I'll leave it there. We could keep talking for so <laughs> long about exactly this. But Kathleen Hanna, it's great to have you on the Thank show. You I so hope much. that you'll come back. We'll continue the conversation. Yes. We're going to go out with a little bit more from Le Tigre. Take a look. He took the bomb. <laughs>